Chapter 2, A Different Approach His head entered first. It was stapled to a long and crooked neck which leaned through the open door. The mouth was larger than my upper body and was built into a permanent smile. The teeth, oh so similar to the ones that covered the floor, circled the inside of his mouth like a vortex. The nose was hooked upwards like it was made to catch fish. There wasn't a hair in sight. I straightened up as much as the pain would allow me and stared at the harbinger in fear. If I got too big for my boots, he'd rip me right out of them. But if I let my heart beat too fast, he would ignore my words as he listened to it stop. I am the harbinger of death, the harbinger repeated. Mankind has destroyed the world it's inhabited for too long. I am your karma. I am the product of your corporate greed. I am a blend of the organic and the inorganic. I am the harbinger of death. I quietly nodded, stalling for time as I thought of something to say. Are you going to say something, Jay Holloway? The harbinger said. I didn't realize I was popular, I finally let out. I really didn't. The creator told us about you, the creation said, slowly dragging his body in with his long arms. Every inch forward was another creak, and with every creak there was a low humming noise that rang from his body as if something in him was charging. My remaining hair stood on edge like it was trying to crawl away. As the harbinger entered the room way too small for him, his face ended up an inch away from mine. I was confronted with the inside of the beast's mouth. The flesh pulsed with excitement, and it was emitting a light blue glow. I had a clear view of his insides. His throat had even more teeth spiraling down, ready to cut any poor soul that fell through. A pale green eye was stuck on one of the teeth, staring at me as the rest of the body most likely floated in the acid of the beast's stomach. The creator? I asked, looking into the eye for too long. The harbinger dragged its legs into the room. His torso was much longer than his legs, and at the bottom of his legs were rusted metal wheels in place of feet. Blending into the rust was old, dried blood. The wheels crushed as many teeth as they could, scratching the noise into my eardrums so I would never forget it. As I thought of why wheels would ever be more useful than legs, the harbinger slammed the door shut and snapped me back into reality. He rolled back against the door and straightened up as much as he could. His fat seemed to be disconnected from his skin as all of it sat at the bottom of his torso, leaving his top half nothing but skin and bones. It was as if somebody forgot to fill him in all the way. He had cuts and bullet wounds all throughout. He had cuts and bullet wounds all throughout. Oh, come on, Jay. You've probably been told all this before. You're a legend. I am? I haven't done anything. To my knowledge, anyways. Despite everything that had happened for five years, I never killed anything besides a chicken. And that was because I tripped onto it. Plenty of other people have survived this long. I'm nothing special. I think so, too. I think you're just lucky, but the creator says that you've had a different approach to her creations than others. One that's allowed you to survive many more encounters than most, the harbinger said, inquisitive but holding back an inherent rage. For some reason, the her caught me off guard, but I guess women could destroy everything just as easily as men. Did the creator say what my different approach was? No. But I'm certainly very interested. She's grown bored of humans recently, so for one to have sparked her interest must mean that you're quite important, the harbinger said while bending down to my eye level. So go ahead. Let's see the approach. The gears in my brain started to turn to think of what my special approach may be. It's not worth it, I said, sitting down. And why not? the harbinger said, bending down even lower. Your cultists out there, they're too far gone now. No way in hell they'd let me go if I kill their god. The harbinger's face wavered as much as it could to give the impression of deep thought. After only a few seconds, his smile started to widen back up. So, if I want a real challenge, he said, as if he had been waiting for this moment for quite some time, I have to kill my worshippers. This was when the gears clicked into place. It wasn't purely luck that had saved me. I had been convincing the creations to spare me and instead go after their cultists. I knew that I had done it before, but I never thought it was a special skill. I just thought creations were waiting for an excuse. I didn't know that I had a silver tongue. At that moment, I felt a lot more responsible for the deaths of dozens. 
Before, I thought I was just the straw that broke the camel's gross, deformed back. But if one straw is breaking so many backs, then the straw should probably self-reflect and really wonder if it should be deciding who lives and who dies. That's where you landed? I said, now trying to avoid responsibility for their deaths. What if you just brought us far away and then gave me like a 30 minute head start to get ready to fight? No, I think I'll kill them. He smiled. They've run their course. I realized that there was no way of changing his mind. Even if I sacrificed myself for them, he'd probably kill them out of anger. It was a minute before I responded. I tried to look tough, like I was sizing the harbinger up, but my mind was racing with concerns. Sure, the cultists were awful people, no good man threatens another with a funnel, but they were just manipulated by awful circumstances. As ill-advised as it was, I believed every person could get better. If I didn't believe that, who knows how long I would have survived everything. So you want a challenge? I said, hiding my true feelings. Are you kidding? How could I not? The worshippers are merely a convenience for me. A luxury I can do without. They bring me a sacrifice because even though I enjoy resting once a week, I still have an insatiable hunger that these bottom feeders satiate for me. Humans have become predictable, so if even the Creator says that you're a worthy challenge, then I'll do anything for a good fight. But to kill your worshippers? I mean, I was already going to fight to survive, but to honor that, I would have to put in some extra work out of obligation. I felt dirt land on my body that I'd never be able to wash off. The harbinger, from what I could understand, laughed. It was as if a vacuum tried to suck up the beach. The disconnected fat in his body moved from bottom to top like he was in a cement mixer. The sheer force of the laugh launched his teeth out of his mouth like loose screws in an earthquake. <laughs> You have a deal, funny man, the harbinger said, his teeth growing back. I'll kill all of them, and you'll put up a good fight. The harbinger put his hand out to shake mine. It was weirdly moist. I reluctantly grabbed it. As if I was nothing but a piece of paper, the harbinger lifted me above his head and held me over his mouth. If you're lying, the harbinger said, and you don't put up a real challenge, then my teeth will tear you to shreds, inch by inch, as slowly as possible. It'll hurt so much that you'll die of the shock before the blood loss, but I still won't stop until you're gone. Understood. <laughs> I was paralyzed with fear and unable to answer, so the harbinger started to lower me towards his mouth. I understand, I shouted. I understand. The harbinger lowered me to the ground, all while laughing in the same grotesque manner as before. Some of his loose teeth hit me in the head. The harbinger turned around to leave, revealing a tail with a spiky ball at the end that must have been curled up behind him. Right outside the door was one of the cultists. Harbinger! the man exclaimed. Why is he still alive? The man screamed as the harbinger lifted him off the ground. The screams washed over the harbinger like a warm shower. Once he was satisfied with his bath, he let go. I wished that I could say that the cultist just slid down the harbinger's throat, but I knew that it was a staggered ride across the sharp teeth. The man's blood began to leak through the part of the harbinger's neck where his head was stapled on. The screams were muffled. The man must have been pressing against the walls of the throat as I saw the skin begin to push and bend from the inside. The bulge moved down the neck and down the chest, but once it entered the lump of fat that made up the harbinger's lower half, the screaming just stopped. The harbinger laughed again. Blood shot out of his neck like a sprinkler, teeth shot out of his mouth like a machine gun, and this time I felt like I could hear the inside of his stomach bouncing up and down. Once he was done, he rolled away to find the others. I was disgusted to my core that this did not slow me down as much as it should have. I was paralyzed with fear, but once you've seen a dozen men swallowed whole, you've seen them all. At least this creation didn't have a transparent stomach. I exited the room, thankful that the harbinger was too distracted with his meal to close the door. Now that I wasn't being dragged around, I stopped and realized just how weird this building was. The room I was in was off of a catwalk in what seemed like an underground warehouse. Why the Harbinger emerged from there was a question I would have asked if I wanted to die a few seconds after finding out. So, for the time, I tiptoed away as fast as I could so as not to alert the Harbinger that I wasn't sitting still and waiting for him.
I quickly realized that being stealthy would ultimately be useless. My bloody feet were leaving a trail behind me, and there was no welcome mat for me to wipe them on. I debated killing myself, thinking it would be funny in a cosmic sense if he killed all of his worshippers just to find me dead. Ultimately, I decided against it. I somehow still had hope for a better tomorrow. As I left, I heard someone screaming behind me. Then another scream. Then another. The screams piled up until my thoughts were drowned out. I never saw how many cultists there were, but there were too many screams to count. Was I responsible for their deaths? And if I was, was it something to feel bad about? They say if you kill a killer, then the amount of killers in the world stays the same. But if one man accidentally leads to the deaths of several dozen sacrifice-making cultists, then it's not exactly a one-to-one -one ratio. Whenever I thought the screaming stopped, it started up again. I must have been running around the warehouse for hours, trapped in a labyrinth-like layout. And the entire time, the screaming never stopped. Even when I finally found the exit, the screaming never stopped. The screaming has never stopped.